Hey everyone, Rua here with the second part of the History and Mythology series. I did not come anywhere close to the many references and adaptations Vanadil has seen over the years, and some of you had good suggestions and even identified things I missed. Going forward, I will probably go into other aspects of history and myth beyond weapons, something for the months to come. I'd be interested to see what people make of this instalment though, so let's get going. The Excalibur is arguably the most famous sword in the entirety of mythology, of any mythos in the world even. Excalibur was the sword used by King Arthur of England, a mythical king who reigned between the 5th and 6th centuries. Hollywood might have misled a lot of people on the origins of the Excalibur by saying it was pulled by Arthur from a stone on Christmas Eve, but Arthur actually got the sword from Nimue, the Lady of the Lake. Excalibur was also Arthur's second sword, his first was Caliburn. Caliburn was the sword which was pulled from the stone, according to the work of Thomas Mallory in the 15th century. Nimue gave the Excalibur to Arthur at the behest of Merlin to battle his treacherous nephew Mordred. Mortally wounded in the ensuing Battle of Camlan, Arthur requested that Excalibur be thrown back into the lake so Nimue could reclaim it, which he did. Arthur was then allegedly laid to rest on the Isle of Avalon, where the legend states that he will someday return to save England from peril. In addition to being a holy sword, Arthurian legend is fantastical as it is, so the feats attributed to the Excalibur are plentiful. Among these, it was able to blind its wielder's opponents with sunlight reflected off its blade, able to shatter a sword greater in size to it in a single strike, and able to regenerate most wounds its wielder sustains. The latter of these two attributes are actually reflected by the in-game attributes of the Excalibur, and that it occasionally deals massive damage proportional to the HP of the wielder, and that it has a strong regen aftermath effect attached to it. Given its stature in Arthurian legend, there is also little surprise that the weapon skill Knights of Round is attached to it, for Arthur was the king that ruled over the Knights of the Round Table. Now, from a fictional sword to a real sword. His owner was the name of the sword used by the Spanish hero Rodrigo Diaz de Vivar, El Cid, as he is otherwise known, wielded the Tizona in his campaigns to drive the Moors from the Iberian Peninsula during the late 11th century in a series of campaigns known collectively as the Reconquista. El Cid's life and legend is absolutely mad. Rodrigo earned the title El Cid, meaning the master, from his Moorish enemies because he was never defeated as a battlefield commander and was never bested in single combat. Of all the legendary feats attributed to El Cid, his final deed absolutely takes the biscuit for me. Before dying of famine during the Siege of Valencia in the year 1099, El Cid asked his wife to have his corpse armoured and strapped to his horse so he could lead one final charge against the besieging Moorish army. When the Moors saw El Cid charging them with his forces, they broke ranks and fled in manic terror as the Iberians cut them down. El Cid everyone, one of the only people to ever win a battle despite being dead. Today the Tizona is one of the national treasures of Spain and is currently on display at the Museum of Burgos. The Tizona's transition to Vanadil is also pretty accurate. The real sword has a distinct pommel and handguard cast in gold and bears two Latin inscriptions on either side of its blade. I am Tizona, made in the year of our Lord 1040. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. The in-game design of the sword likewise bears inscriptions on both sides of the blade and it has the same colour scheme as the real Tizona. The only difference is that the real Tizona is not a scimitar, it's a long sword. But uh, I put that down to thematic necessity since it is a blue mage that wields it. It's a bit ironic considering the history behind it though, since scimitars were the swords of choice for the Moors. On a final note, El Cid's side sword was the Colada, which also exists in Vanadil. The Imer is an axe from Semitic, specifically Phoenician mythology. We're going back far through time for this one, so bear with me. For the further back you go in history, the murkier things become. Semitic mythology is a particularly difficult subject to make heads or tails of. The field is wide and varied, including as it does Babylonia, Mesopotamia, Arabia, ancient Israel, Phoenicia, and Syria. Like many of the religions of antiquity, Semitic mythology was a polytheistic faith with a large pantheon of deities. In this pantheon there was a god of craftsmanship called Kothar Wakahasis. Kothar created two weapons to be used by the god of storms Baal Hadad to defeat the sea god Yamnahar, the Ima and the Agrush, driver and chaser. 
During the Baal cycle of the mythology, Yamnaha sought to overthrow the divine order and rule over the gods himself. Baal Haddad opposed him, and after a pitched battle emerged the victor thanks to the Ima striking true where the Yagrash had failed. There are some attributes the Ima of Anadil possesses which acknowledges as its Semitic origin. The fact that it's an axe exclusive to Beastmasters is fitting since it was the weapon of choice for Baal Haddad, the king of the gods, who held dominion over the divine order. In a similar manner, a Beastmaster holds dominion over the ecosystems of Banadil and also holds sway over the monsters it can call to aid it in battle. The weapon skill Primal Ren's animation also acknowledges Baal Haddad's powers as a god of storms. For if you look carefully at the attack animation, you will notice the Ima summons a bolt of white lightning to strike the target. Yagrush's Mystic Boon has a similar animation as well. Very clever design there, Square Enix. Terpsichore was one of the nine muses of Greek mythology. The patron of dance and choral music, as well as the mother of the sirens. In ancient Greek mythology, the muses were goddesses associated with song and dance, the performing arts. Each of them were assigned a literary sphere, with Terpsichore providing patronage to the arts of dance and choral music. The earliest forms of dance had a specifically religious purpose. One purpose was to participate in patterns which the ancient Greeks believed governed the universe. Dancing therefore tended to be religious processions or reenactments of myths, although there were also forms of dancing that were just for entertainment. Suffice to say, dancing played an important role in ancient Greek culture, so it stands to reason Terpsichore was so revered. This also explains why the weapon skill attached to the dancer dagger bearing her name is Pyrikleos. Kleos, translated to glory, is a concept from ancient Greece and carries the implied meaning of what others hear about you. It is widespread across Greek mythology, with Kleos being a driving force for heroes ranging from Jason and the Argonauts who join him on his quest, to Agamemnon in the Iliad, to Telemachus in the Odyssey. A Greek hero earns Kleos through accomplishing great deeds, and the same can be said of any dancer of Anadil who attains such a degree of fame in battle. If you ask me, dancers remain a rare sight in Vanadil, so whenever one encounters a powerful and skilled dancer, they tend to remember them and word about them gets around. Hmm, quite fitting when you think about it that way. The Heishai Shurinkan is one of the national treasures of Japan. Forged during the Asuka period, the weapon was brought to Japan around the same time Buddhism was introduced to the country from China. This historical estimation comes from the fact that the Heishai Shorinkan eventually ended up in the possession of the famous prince Shotoku Taishi, himself an early convert to the emergent Buddhist faith. The Heishai Shorinkan currently resides in the Shetenoji Buddhist Temple in Osaka, the very temple Prince Taishi founded. The Heishai Shorinkan is a short sword forged in the Chokuto style, meaning it is a single-edged blade meant to be drawn quickly from the waist for quick, precise attacks. Its distinct feature comes with the Chinese characters reading He Shai Shou Rin, engraved in gold on the side of the blade. These attributes translate perfectly to the way the weapon is presented in Banadil, as it is likewise a single-edged katana with a golden inlay on the side of the blade. Idris is an immortal figure in Islamic scripture, mentioned in the Quran as a prophet. According to the traditions of the Sunnah, a major sect of Islam, Idris appeared sometime between the prophets Adam and Noah and inscribed divine revelation through several books he wrote. Islamic tradition has also unanimously identified Idris with the biblical figure Enoch, as the two bear many similarities. The name Idris has been described as having the origin of the meaning interpreter. Traditionally, Islam holds the prophet as having functioned in an interpretive and mystical role, Therefore, this meaning garnered general acceptance. From here, we can see that similarities can be drawn between the prophet Idris and the geomancer Ergon which bears his name. Idris was the interpreter of divine will, and comparatively, according to Vanadil's law, geomancers are the conduits of the life stream and convey its will to others who cannot listen. The casting of geomancy is entirely based on the geomancer's communion with the spirits of the planet, it's therefore quite fitting that the symbol of a storied and elevated geomancer bears the namesake of such a revered figure in Islam. Ukon Vasara literally translates to Hammer of Uko. Uko was the god of the sky, weather, and thunder in Finnish mythology. He is the most significant among the Finnish pantheon and bears many similarities to the Norse god of thunder Thor. Even their symbols look very much alike. This should not be surprising to anyone who sees how close Finland is to the Norse regions of Scandinavia, 
that is to say Norway, Denmark and Sweden where Norse mythology originated. During the Christianization of Finland, Ukko was conflated with that of the Christian god, and the process was made simple thanks to the two deities' relative similarities in status. Considering the craftsmanship tools the Finnish would have had available at the time for a frame of reference, it is likely that Ukko's hammer was originally a boat-shaped stone axe. When you know this, the odd and unique design of the Emperor Great Axe and Vanadil of the same name suddenly makes a lot more sense. As far as great axes go in Vanadil, the Yukon Vasara is definitely unique because it does not resemble a great axe at all. If anything, it resembles a great hammer. If you look closely at the Yukon Vasara, you'll notice that the head of the weapon incorporates Uko's symbol, has a stone hammer on the end of it rather than an axe blade, and the hammer itself resembles a boat. Uko's fury being the weapon skill attached to the Yukon Vasara is very fitting as it pays homage to the weapon's original owner. If the Yukon Vasara is truly the Finnish equivalent to Thor's Mjolnir, then that would also account for the incredible destructive power of the weapon in Vanadil, as it becomes capable of tripling its damage when the aftermath effect of Ukko's fury is activated. The joy use was the sword of Charlemagne, the first Holy Roman Emperor. Charlemagne, put simply, is serious business to any European historian, and it's pretty much impossible not to come across his name in any major study as to the origins of Europe. After the fall of the Roman Empire, Charlemagne was the first to reunite Western Europe, succeeding where Justinian had failed in the East. He ruled a vast kingdom that encompassed what is now France, Germany, Italy, Austria and others, consolidating and ensuring Christianity's dominance in Europe for centuries to come. In the year 800, Pope Leo III crowned Charlemagne Emperor of the Romans. In this role, he encouraged the Carolingian Renaissance, a cultural and intellectual revival in Europe. Due to his achievements, Charlemagne was one of the few monarchs to be honoured with the title Carolus Magnus, meaning Charles the Great. Charlemagne is widely considered by historians to be the father of Europe, and given his legacy, it's pretty hard to debate that he wasn't. With this history in mind, the Joyeuse of Vanadil does have a nod to the real sword, which currently resides in the Louvre Museum in Paris. The only major mistake being made in transition is that the Joyeuse is a longsword and not a rapier. The Joyeuse was famous for its light weight, which made it look like a golden white blur when used in battle. This accounts for its famous double attack rate. It possessing darkness resistance is also potentially a reference to the fact that the Joyeuse's original wielder, Charlemagne, was the first Holy Roman Emperor, the one who brought the light of Christianity back to the land and restored order from the darkness. In Japanese mythology, Amana Murakumo no Tsurugi, or the Sword of the Gathering Clouds of Heaven, is the divine sword of the Kami Suzano. Suzuno is one of three children created by Izanagi when he washed his face clean of the pollutants of Yomi, the underworld, when he returned from the underworld. Suzuno is portrayed in various stories either as a wild, impetuous god associated with the sea and storms, as a heroic figure who killed a monstrous serpent, or as a local deity linked with the harvest and agriculture. Suzuno obtained the Amana Murakumo by slaying a serpent with eight heads, the Yamato no Orochi and later devoted the sword to his sister, Amaterasu, the goddess of the sun. Once the Amana Murakumo was in the possession of Amaterasu, it became known as the Kusanagi no Sarugi, and was one of the three focal points, the three being sword, mirror, and ornamental bead, that made the symbol of the Emperor's throne of Japan, the symbol called the Three Sacred Treasures. This brings us to the end of this venture through history and legend. I'm open to keeping this series going on the side and to widen its scope, but to do so I think I'm going to need input from you, the audience, as my own knowledge is hardly encyclopedic. When the time for another instalment approaches, I'll post a notification in the community tab of my channel, so if you have something to bring up you can share it. I'll see you all next time.